Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves, continuing medical education podcast. Join us for a lively discussion on the latest and greatest in the field of electrocardiography. We'll discuss some of the exciting and innovative work happening at Mayo Clinic and beyond with the most brilliant minds in the space and provide valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Welcome to Mayo Clinic's ECG segment, Making Waves. The human heart, as intricate as it is, reveals nuances that can be pivotal in understanding broader health narratives. One such nuance, the diagnosis of left ventricular hypertrophy, or LVH, by means of the ECG. It bears a significance that intertwines with the fabric of race and ethnicity. Today, we will venture into this topic and attempt to unravel the performance of current ECG criteria in diagnosing LVH, questioning whether these criteria generally represent its prevalence across diverse and racial and ethnic groups. We will also dive into the mechanistic explanations and the pathophysiologic basis that might account for such differences, and discuss whether race or ethnic specific cutoffs for LVH are needed. We're excited to have Dr. Mary Tiffany Odua joining us today. She's a cardiology fellow here with me at Mayo Clinic Rochester, who has an international journey that began with her upbringing in Nigeria. She earned her Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry and Biotechnology in Minnesota before venturing to Poland for her medical degree. Subsequently, she returned to the United States, joining Mayo Clinic in Rochester for her internal medicine residency. With passion spanning mentorship, medical education, and global health, Dr. Odua is especially drawn to critical care cardiology, echocardiography, and enhancing medical care quality in resource-limited settings. Her commitment recently took her to Malawi, Malawi and Nigeria, where she collaborated with fellow cardiologists and internists to serve underprivileged communities. It's a true honor to introduce you to Dr. Odua and having her with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Kashu, for having me on the show. I'm excited to talk about LVH and Africans and African Americans and the use of ECG for that purpose. Well, you know, I, I couldn't think of, you know, anyone better that is so passionate about, you know, not only teaching and educating and just reaching an underserved population uh, than you. And so I, I've been looking forward to this and, you know, to get our, um, you know, our audience up to date and on this topic, maybe Tell us how significant diagnosing left ventricular hypertrophy or LVH using the ECG is. That's a great question. So, I mean, I'd like to start with the definition of LV hypertrophy. And it's right in the name. So LV hypertrophy refers to LV enlargement or, or increased left ventricular mass. This can be the result of pressure or volume overload states. So we term that concentric and eccentric hypertrophy respectively. But it can also be seen in physiologic states such as in athletes. Most ECG criteria for detection of LV hypertrophy try to provide the best estimate of LV mass. With the advent of multimodal imaging techniques such as echocardiography and MRI, as well as, well, one of the limitations of the ECG being those discrepancies that we see between the ECG and these imaging techniques, some would argue to the effect of diminishing um, use of the electrocardiogram in LVH detection. Still, there is a basis for why we use the ECG. It lies in a basic concept of action potential generation and propagation. ECG waveforms end up being proportional to the number and function of cardiac myocytes and LV mass. In addition, a hypertrophied heart tends to be closer to the chest wall and closer to the surface ECG precordial leads. And these factors account for an increase in the QRS amplitude. And so it's hard to argue against a readily available, easily performed test with little cost impact, such as the ECG. Oh, oh, thank you. And I think you ni nicely put it there in this non-invasive, pain-free, easily to perform something that even can reach, you know, our underserved population exactly. still has value. I wonder, you know, what your thoughts are on how accurate the current ECG criteria, and there's a number of them, you know, last I looked, I think there was over 50 or so. So it, it's a lot, but how, how do they do in terms of accuracy? And then how do they do across different racial and ethnic groups? Yeah, and, and that's the crux of our discussion. You know, we discussed the basic mechanism for how the QRS is formed on the surface ECG and how it's largely proportional to increased LV myocytes as seen, as LV, as seen in LV hypertrophy. Well, electrocardiographic diagnosis of LVH is currently based on voltage criteria for the most part. 
QRS patterns that are seen in actual anatomic LV hypertrophy can vary from increased QRS amplitude to, to the duration, and even frank bondoloid patterns. As you said, there's over 50 criteria for detection of LVH on the ECG. Most of these criteria focus on the QRS amplitude or voltage. However, the QRS voltage increase in the setting of actual anatomical LV hypertrophy is not a consistent finding. And this is reflected in the wide range of both sensitivities, anywhere from 60% and specificities, which is usually higher, 80 to 90% of this criteria for LVH. There's certain conditions that can also affect the degree of positive deflection of the QRS. So any condition where the normal conduction pathway is interrupted, for example, in a left bundle branch block or Wolf-Parkinson-White. And I mean, there's other ways that you can identify probable LVH in these conditions. However, we know that the specificities and the sensitivities can vary quite a lot for, for a number of these reasons. In general, LVH criteria tend to be more specific for true anatomic LVH across populations. The way I think about it, there's not a lot of things that can cause an increased QRH voltage on the surface ECG. An important clue though lies in the history. For example, if your patient has hypertension or valvular disease, cardiomyopathy, et cetera, that increases the probability of LV hypertrophy, even before looking at the ECG. Other pointers on the ECG include the presence of LV strain pattern, left atrial enlargement, and these can, these can actually improve the accuracy of your ECG in detecting LVH. Importantly for this talk, there's differences in the specificity and sensitivity that, that also vary depending on the race and ethnicity due to the cutoffs that are used by most of these criteria. And when I think about it, it just makes sense. Most of these criteria were developed in mostly Caucasian populations, and that's where the cutoffs were derived. Okay. Okay. So I, I mean, that's something I've noticed too, is that when I, you know, see patients in clinic, they're not always, you know, consistent. And then, you know, you think there might be LVH and it's not present. So the variability is certainly something I think we can both attest to. We see every day. And there's a patient I did see this morning, actually, just in clinic, a Black patient, you know, the echo had shown LV hypertrophy, and that was one of the reasons he'd been sent to us as a question of hypertension versus HCM and this and that. I, I for the purpose of this talk, just uh, took the liberty of looking at the ECG and actually did not meet any of the criteria for LV hypertrophy. So I thought that that was pretty interesting. So I thought I'd mention that. No, I, I appreciate it. And like I said, you're seeing it today in clinic this morning. Now, um, thinking about mechanisms and pathophysiology, are there any reasons that you can think of of why these observed racial and ethnic differences would exist for LVH? I think the jury's still out on that. I, I like to go back to the basics. So when we think of physiologic LV activation, it's usually directed away from the right-sided lead, so your V1 and V2, towards your left-sided lead, so V5, V6, AVL. And so leads V1 and V2 manifest a predominantly S-wave. Um, and because the left ventricle is situated mostly leftward and posteriorly, normal LV activation results in a predominant R-wave in those left-sided leads. When you have an increased LV mass, such as, as we see in LV hypertrophy, the S wave in V1 and V2 become deeper, and the R wave in AVL, V5, V6 become taller. Now, the voltage criteria for LVH detection on ECG utilize this concept. It, I, I was intrigued to find a newer EKG criterion. Um, we, we're all pretty familiar with Cornell and the Socolow Leon uh, criteria, but I found a different one called the Peguero Lepresti which was actually recently developed and was found to perform better in many populations compared to the commonly used Cornell and Socolow Leon criteria with an area under the curve of about 0.83 compared to 0.72 and 0.62 for these others. Interestingly, however, its performance was assessed in a recent cross-sectional study in 2021. So basically hypertensive patients out of Cameroon in West Africa were looked at. And when they apply this criteria, it did not actually perform stat statistically significantly more accurately or less accurately than the established um, Cornell or Sokolov criteria. One reason that was cited by the authors was that the prevalence of eccentric LV hypertrophy in that population may have contributed to that, just being that we also have the data to suggest that eccentric LVH is less accurately detected by ECG compared to concentric hypertrophy. 
I think overall that there is enough to tell us that there is more to the surface ECG voltage beyond LV mass. Some of the postulated mechanisms for the differing cutoffs and QRS voltages in Africans have to do with higher voltage generation for a given myocardial mass compared to Caucasians. There's also con a concern that there might be differences in the thoracic cavity contour, which affects the positioning of the heart within the thorax. I don't know that any of these have been confirmed, but these are postulations that are out there. Oh, it sounds like a, a research idea for a fellow, certainly. Uh, <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> now, you know, in thinking about healthy Africans, healthy Caucasians, let's say no risk factors that would, you know, cause LVH, hypertension, chronic kidney disease. Do Africans then generally show higher voltages uh, on the ECG compared to um, Caucasians? That's a great question. Indeed, these factors, hypertension, CKD, and even more recently, a recent study um, that was done by the H3 Africa Consortium in 2017 on patients with LVH and stroke, you know, these, these factors do indeed increase the prevalence of LV hypertrophy. Um, that study found that this was more seen in patients who are younger age, female sex, or diastolic hypertension. What, what I thought was even more intriguing, there was a recent study named the Tanve Health Study. It was published earlier this year in the Journal of Electrocardiography. It was also a cross-sectional study that characterized ECG profiles, particularly with regard to the amplitude and the duration of different waveforms and how these were applied in the diagnosis of LV hypertrophy for, for healthy sub-Saharan Africans. This was done in Benin Republic. Overall, their findings confirmed a higher voltage ECG in African populations. The norms were defined as being, for the most part, higher than those that are currently applied in these criteria. So it would suggest that indeed, um, there tends to be just a higher um, LV hypertrophy or ECG signs of LV hypertrophy, in, 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 even in healthy populations. It's, it's interesting. And I, I think I've seen that in you know, it's good to hear that. Now, given the variation in, you know, you mentioned a new uh, algorithm that I have to still learn myself. Um, but as you mentioned, I can't keep up with them all. What do you see as like potential implications of applying these current criteria universally across racial and ethnic groups, especially in the Africans and African-American uh, cohorts? So I think this is probably the highlight of this conversation that we're having. Um, I was in Malawi and Nigeria earlier this year, as you mentioned. Um, the, the specific hospital settings that I was in were very resource limited. So ECG remains to be an easily accessible test for getting a ton of information about your patients in front of you. So with applying universal criteria such as for LVH, where in some situations we don't have the benefit of doing an echo or an MRI to confirm this finding, you know, we can, there's a lot of false positive tests that can occur with their downstream consequences, um, the emotional impact, you know, just of telling your patient, I think it's somewhat underestimated. I mean, you tell a patient your heart is abnormal. They go home thinking about that for weeks and months, you know. Um, so I think that's one first important uh, aspect of a false positive test here. But another implication is just the domino effect of further testing. You know, we already highlighted that these areas are resource limited sometimes. And when you have to weigh the cost heavily in making clinical decisions, you, you, you'd rather criteria that are pretty, pretty accurate and pretty sensitive and specific for, for checking for, check for LVH in, in these patients. Now, there seems to be a higher prevalence of LV hypertrophy in Black patients compared to white patients. And studies continue to show that elevated blood pressure is one of the main determinants in Black Africans, although they've also found anthropometric variables can influence LV mass. So I think in summary, normal ECG values vary not only according to age and sex, but is also a function of race and ethnicity. Well, thank you so much for highlighting those and even sharing your own personal experience of you know how these implications impact real people's lives. And, and mm -hmm. we, you know, fortunately here in the U.S. at Mayo Clinic, we have so many resources. Um, it's not always the case, but also we want to do a better job to minimize the testing. As you mm -hmm. mentioned, it just increases the the angst, the anxiety of some of our patients. And I, I think you really mentioned at the end, this is probably the most important thing, the implications of it. So thank you for for mentioning that. Thank you for having me. Now, in today's enlightening episode, we heard from Dr. Odua, 
we navigated the intricate landscape of diagnosing left ventricular hypertrophy using the ECG. We underscored the importance of accurate and representative criteria. Our dive into the current ECG criteria, she mentioned a new one, revealed potential disparities in its performance across racial and ethnic boundaries, prompting a reflection on its true depiction of left ventricular hypertrophy prevalence in these diverse groups. The broad implications of a universal application of the LVH diagnostic criteria bring to light potential challenges in the call for the possible need of more specific thresholds for race and ethnicity for greater precision. It is clear there's so much more work to do and another project for a fellow. Dr. Odua, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We're grateful for your support and look forward to watching your incredible future uh, evolve. We hope you'll join us again. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Kashu. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast at cveducation.mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular CME Podcast on your favorite platform and tune in to explore today's most pressing electrocardiography topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic. This has been a Mayo Clinic Podcast.
Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast at cveducation.mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular CME Podcast on your favorite platform and tune in to explore today's most pressing electrocardiography topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic. This has been a Mayo Clinic podcast.